Manager for NIBCO Incorporated and the Chairman of the ASA Safety Committee and Alliance with OSHA. Almost monthly, the committee publishes articles and toolbox talks on various safety subjects. These can be viewed and downloaded from the ASA site, www.asa.net. Also available on the ASA site are recordings and downloads of previous webinars. All of these items are available free to the public. Look for the Safety Resources link on the ASA homepage, which is located at www.asa.net. If you have any problems, contact Ben Stevens at ASA for assistance. This webinar is being recorded for later viewing. Everyone that registered for the webinar will receive an email notifying them when the replay is available and a link to its location. All attendees today are in mute mode. To submit a question during the presentation, you can enter it in the chat window. Before you send it, be sure the settings are set to organizers and panelists so that we can see the question. Questions will be answered at the end of the presentation as time allows. Also, a document with all questions and their answers and other documents related to the webinar will be posted on the ASA site along with the replay of the webinar. The webinar today is Operator Uplift Trucks and Aerial Work Platforms Best Practices. The presentation today covers best practices and is not intended to be all-encompassing or a replacement for training. We have two highly qualified presenters today. The first is Mr. Rudy Corvez, who is the Corporate Safety Administrator for Associated, an authorized service center for the Raymond Corporation. The second presenter is Mr. Mark Fleshman, who is an operator safety instructor with Randall Industries. Full bios of the presenters will be posted with the webinar documents on the ASA site. And now I turn the presentation over to Rudy. Thank you, Ricky. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to thank everyone once again for uh, your participation in today's presentation on operator truck and aerial work platform safety. Um, lift trucks and aerial lifts are, are great tools, and they're a necessary part of many industries. Uh, but they can also cause serious injury and death uh, if they are not properly used. Uh, there's literally thousands of people that are seriously injured and another hundred or so people killed every year on this type of equipment. Um, the majority of accidents are caused by operator error, um, which is the strong argument as to why proper training is such an important part of a comprehensive uh, safety program. Uh, it's unfortunate, however, that there are still many companies out there not providing adequate training to their operators. Uh, in a lot of places, uh, employers are trusting employees with little or no training to use these very expensive and potentially dangerous equipment. Um, that's not only a danger to that operator, but a danger to anybody else working uh, around them. Now, when it comes to operator up trucks, such as order pickers, um, they can be especially dangerous because the operator is actually going up with the load. Uh, so you must provide fall protection as well. And additional training on how to properly use and inspect that equipment. So let's take a look at the agenda. Um, I will be doing the first portion on operator up trucks. Um, and my presentation uh, is going to cover the best practices for operator up lift trucks and that will also include an overview on the two most commonly used operator up trucks and what OSHA and ANSI standards apply to these type of trucks and some best practices to include in your operator training classes. Uh, at that point I will turn it over to Mark who is going to discuss uh, best practices for aerial work platforms. Uh, and again, as Ricky stated, if you have questions, please submit those um, uh, through the website, and we will address those at the end of the presentation. So I would like to start today by going over uh, some of the features of the two more commonly used operator of trucks, which are order pickers and swing reaches. 
Now, order pickers are known by a lot of different names. It really depends on the facility. Uh, you will hear operators uh, refer to them as cherry pickers, man ups, high lifts, um, and stock pickers, to name a few. Uh, these are class two electric motor narrow aisle trucks. Uh, and they may not look like much, but on average, they can weigh anywhere from 7,000 to 9,000 pounds or more. The battery alone on one of these trucks weighs up to 3,000 pounds. Uh, so to put that into a little bit more perspective, your average car weighs around 3,000 pounds. So that means that the battery on one of these order pickers could weigh as much as the car. Now the name says it all for this type of truck. It's used to pick orders. Uh, operators will place a pallet on the forks. Um, that pallet locks onto those forks. Um, and the operator, you know, can pick orders ranging from as small as, you know, small boxes to bigger things like furniture. Uh, they typically have rated capacities of three to four thousand pounds, and they can raise their platform to heights of twenty to thirty feet. So let's recap that real quick. They weigh as much as three cars. They elevate the operator over twenty feet in the air, and they could be carrying an additional three to four thousand pounds. Uh, of additional weight. So I think you can see why in the, ha the hands of the wrong individual this can be a very dangerous situation. Um, some order pickers can also be used on a wire guidance system which I will talk about a little bit further on in the presentation. Another commonly used uh, operator of truck is your swing reach truck uh, which are also known as turret trucks, and they are a bit larger uh, than your order picker. They are also a class two electric motor narrow aisle truck, um, and they also raise the operator up with the load, like you see in the, uh, the picture in front of you. They can be used standing up, they can be used sitting down. And these type of trucks are a little bit more sophisticated. Uh, as well, they actually allow the operator to pick entire pallets from either side of an aisle, or they can be used um, as a traditional order picker for smaller packages as well. Um, they weigh anywhere from 12,000 to 15,000 pounds, uh, which going back to the comparison to a car is really about four or as much as four or five cars. And they can also lift loads of up to 4,000 pounds, and they can reach heights of over 40 feet uh, which is extremely high up, and they can also be used on wire guidance. All right, this is optional, and, and I'll talk about that in a second here. So, uh, those are your two more most commonly used operator up lift trucks that you will see out there. I think more than anything, you will see order pickers and various variations of that truck, uh, and a lot of the main uh, bigger man lift truck manufacturers have an order picker style truck. Uh, so now that we've talked about those trucks, let's take a look at the OSHA and ANSI standards for the safe operation of these and all operator lift trucks. Now, uh, I'd like to start off by stating that OSHA regulations from General Industry uh, 1910 and Construction 1926 are not interchangeable. Um, your manufacturing facilities, your warehousing and supply chain operations will typically fall under 1910 general industry. Uh, and that's what we will be focusing on in this presentation. I've had plenty of people over the years uh, quote something or a standard from 1926, and I had to explain that those regulations don't apply to general industry. Um, for example, trigger heights that require fall protection are different in general industry than they are in construction. Um, for general industry, that trigger height is four feet, whereas um, in construction, that height is six feet. And, and there's a lot of other differences, but again, you just want to note that they are a completely different set of rules, um, and you should follow whichever ones apply to you. So again, in this, for this presentation, we're going to be talking about general industry uh, and how it applies to lift trucks. Now, there's an OSHA standard that covers powered industrial trucks, and that is 1910-178. Uh, the standard, like a lot of OSHA standards, 
is performance oriented, which means that the employer can tailor the program to fit the needs of their particular operation. However, OSHA is very specific about how training must be conducted and what topics must be covered. All right? As an employer, you have to provide both classroom and hands-on instruction. Uh, the topics that need to be covered are broken down into truck-specific topics and workplace-related topics. Now, OSHA lists what topics need to be covered within the standard, 1910-178. So I highly recommend that if you are not familiar with the standard requirements that you take a look at that particular standard by visiting the OSHA website or looking at your OSHA 1910 general industry book and looking at a complete list of those topics. Um, at the minimum, your training should cover these topics except for any topic that does not apply to your workplace. Now the, work, the truck related topics include things like operating instructions, the differences between a car and a, and a forklift, truck controls, steering maneuvering, um, how to inspect the truck, and in the cases of operator uplift trucks, it should also include how to properly wear uh, any personal protective equipment that is required to be used, whether it is a safety belt or a, a safety harness. Um, and again, the training should include what type of fall protection they are supposed to wear, how to properly inspect it, how to properly wear it, and who they should report problems to if there's any issues with that fall protection or any other problems with that lift truck. Um, the workplace related topics are going to include things like surface condition, um, where the truck is going to be operated, load manipulation, so stacking, unstacking, and how to operate in narrow aisles. Um, as I mentioned, the both the order picker and the swing reach are narrow aisle trucks. So if you have narrow aisles and that is where they're going to be operating these trucks, then that should be covered in your workplace specific training. Uh, if you're using wire guidance in your facility, then your training is going to include how to enter and exit these wire guided aisles and how to operate safely within these aisles. All right, there's also other training requirements uh, for powered industrial trucks like um, the evaluation, so you must evaluate your operator's performance in your workplace. So in other words, you can't send your operators off-site to do training. That training should be conducted on-site at your facility so that you can address your specific issues. All right, so you're going to do an evaluation um, right after their initial training. Uh, Any time that you provide refresher training, whether it's because you're introducing a new type of truck, or whether an operator has been involved in an accident. Uh, so any, after any refresher training, you're going to do another evaluation. And at least once every three years, uh, all of your operators must be re-evaluated and recertified. Uh, and that's actually one of the areas that OSHA cites more often when citing customers uh, for powered industrial trucks. Um, You'll have operators that have been using the truck four or five years, and they haven't been reevaluated and recertified. Something pretty simple to do, but easy to forget, and uh, a lot of uh, people get dinged for that. Um, you also have to certify that each operator has been properly trained and evaluated. So once you've done your evaluation, you have to issue certification. That's for all lift trucks, including operator up trucks. Um, so on that certification that you're issuing, you have to include the name of the operator, uh, the date of the training, the date of the evaluation, the name of the person who conducted training, and each type of truck that that operator is going to be certified to operate. Um, so along with that particular OSHA standard, you have um, excuse me here. You also have the Occupational Safety and Health Act of 1970, all right, which is also referred to as the General Duty Clause. And the General Duty Clause states that uh, a each employer has to furnish to each of his employees employment 
a place of employment that is free from recognized hazards that are causing or are likely to cause death or serious physical harm uh, to their employees, um, that they shall comply with the occupational safety and health standards uh, under this act. It also states that each employee has to comply with the regulation, occupational safety and health standards and all rules, regulations, and ordered issues issued pursuant to this act. Now, um, this is important to remember because in cases where employers are cited by OSHA uh, for lack of fall protection, um, they usually weren't cited because of the type of fall protection they're using, but rather because of the lack of fall protection or not using the fall protection properly. Now, I've been to places where operators are using a harness, uh, and, but they're not using the leg straps. So it kind of defeats the whole purpose of using the harness. Uh, in those cases, uh, OSHA is going to cite the general duty clause. And that is because there isn't a standard that addresses fall protection on lift trucks, and 1910-178 does not address fall protection either. It's kind of a gray area. So when uh, employers are being cited for this, OSHA is using the general duty clause. Uh, they use this for anything or any unsafe act or condition where there isn't a specific standard to cite. They can always cite the general duty clause. All right? So along with complying with OSHA 1910 and 178 uh, and the Occupational Safety and Health Act of 1970, there are also uh, ANSI standards that address lift truck safety as well. In this case, it's ANSI B56.1, uh, the newest version, which is uh, from 2009. And this is safety standards for low lift and high lift trucks. Now, um, ANSI standards on their own are not laws, but OSHA can incorporate them into OSHA standards and therefore making them law which is the case with this particular ANSI standard, all right? And I, didn't, I don't have the whole standard on here. I only have the section that discusses elevating personnel, which is where it, what the, the only area where it talks about fall protection, all right? And it talks about, in section 4.17, it talks about elevating personnel. Uh, 4.17.1 states that only operator uplift trucks that have been designed to lift personnel um, if a work platform is used on truck design and intended for handling materials, the requirements of paragraph 4.17.2 and 4.17.3 shall be met for the protection of personnel. Um, whenever a truck is used to elevate personnel, the following precautions for protection of personnel shall be taken. All right? the, um, the truck has to comply with the design requirements of a different paragraph, 7.367, which we won't discuss, uh, and that's really more for the manufacturer. Um, provide protection for personnel in their normal working position on the platform from moving parts of the truck that represent a hazard. Uh, and C is where it actually talks about fall protection. Be certain that required restraining means such as railings, chains, cable, body belts with lanyards, or deceleration devices, etc., are in place and properly used. Uh, a lot of times I will have people say, well, you have to use the safety harness and not the belt. And I won't argue that the safety harness is probably the better option. But you can see here that it is not required by OSHA that you wear the safety harness. It is highly recommended that you use it. But if you're using a standard belt and tether, um, that is also fine as long as it is being properly used. Uh, D states that be certain that lifting mechanism the lifting mechanism is operating smoothly throughout its entire lift height, both empty and loaded, and that all lift limiting devices and latches, if provided, are functional. This is something that you would inspect during your daily inspection. E states that we should provide overhead protection as necessary by the operating conditions, and F states that you should replace any body belt, lanyard, or deceleration device that has sustained permanent deformation or is otherwise defective. And this is really the only areas where it is fall protection is addressed as far as uh, OSHA and ANSI standards. So again, uh, I recommend as well that we use the harness. But again, it's really more about whatever you're going to use 
teach your operators how to properly use it, make sure that it fits them properly, and that they know how to inspect that equipment as well, and who can they report this if there's an issue with it. So now that we've gone through those standards, um, these are some best practices for the safe operation of these type of trucks. Now with any lift truck, uh, not only is it a best practice, it is an OSHA requirement that you inspect your lift truck prior to operation. All right? It's one inspection per shift. So if you're running multiple shifts and lift trucks are being used on all shifts, each shift has to conduct their own inspection of the lift truck. Right? And it's one per truck per shift. So you have, for example, one department sharing one lift truck. Um, the way the OSHA standard is written, you only have to conduct one inspection if they're all working on the same shift. So the first person who would use that truck would conduct the daily inspection. Um, technically, you don't have to keep a paper checklist uh, but it is highly recommended that you do so, not just for maintenance purposes, but again, to be able to prove that you are conducting these inspections as well. And again, it's one per shift, per truck, um, and you want to make sure that you teach your operators how to properly conduct an inspection. That should be one of the first things that you do in your training is, is show them how to conduct an inspection for the equipment that they're going to be using. Along with learning, learning how to inspect the truck, you should also learn how to inspect your body belt or harness. And in bigger facilities where each operator has their own truck, um, it's, it's a best practice to you know, probably purchase one for each operator so that you can ensure that they have the proper fit. Uh, I've been in places where you've got you know, a guy who's 6'3", 6 6'4", 6 um, sharing a harness with a guy who's 5'3", 5'4". Uh, and it fits fine on the guy who's 6'3", six, 6'4", six, but that guy who, who's 5'3", five, 5'4", five, you know, it doesn't fit him as well, and it could be a safety issue. So it's not required, but again, if you're going to be having your operators uh, use their own truck, it's probably best to also get them their own belt or harness. All right? You never want to place any part of your body outside the side gates while operating the lift truck. Not every truck does this, but a lot of order pickers, if your side gates are up, um, that there's a cutoff switch that won't allow the operator to move forward or, or move anywhere. All right? Those have to be down. But not all operator up trucks come with that cutoff switch. There's plenty of trucks out there where if the, the gates are up, the operator still can move that in any direction they want. They can lift, they can lower. They can do anything because uh, there is no cutoff switch there. But regardless of whether it's there or not, you need to teach your operator that they need to stay inside of the operator compartment. Right? Uh, don't handle unstable or loosely stacked loads. I think that goes without saying that that is an issue um, that can affect both the operator and anybody working underneath or around that truck. You also always want to check for overhead obstructions before raising the platform. Uh, it's one thing when you're raising just the load and the operator is all the way at ground level. It's another thing when the operator is actually going up with the load as well. There's plenty of overhead obstructions that these operators can hit. I mean, people have hit heaters. They've hit sprinkler lines and flooded their whole warehouse. You can hit pallets that are sticking out because somebody didn't properly place it on the rack. Um, you also never want to let anyone stand or pass under your elevated load um, or platform, all right, in case anything falls from it or in case the operator starts to lower the platform, they don't uh, have to worry about somebody standing underneath it. You always want to yield to pedestrians. Um, so the operator should be taught to look out for them um, and at the end of every aisle they should be stopping, beeping their horn and looking both ways to make sure that they don't hit a pedestrian or another truck that's driving by. Um, operator up lift trucks like order pickers and stream reaches uh, are typically not allowed to drive, be driven on ramps or any kind of incline uh, because they don't have the clearance for that. They're very low to the ground and I've seen people try to take them on ramps and the truck ends up getting stuck. This isn't something that you can just you know, get four or five people and just push off and get it off. Uh, if it's stuck on there, if you don't have another lift truck 
or another piece of heavy equipment to help get it off, that truck will be stuck there until you can get somebody out there to remove. Um, you also shouldn't be using order pickers to place or remove pallets from racking. I've seen people do that. That is not what these trucks are intended to use. Again, the name kind of says it all. It's an order picker. It's used to pick orders, not to pick entire pallets. Now, on a swing reach, you can do that. It's a bigger truck. It's designed for that. As I stated earlier, you can pick. It's actually pretty neat. You can pick from both sides of the aisle, but that truck is designed to do it while your order picker is not. Um, now, earlier I mentioned the wire guidance and rail guidance. Um, this is used in very narrow aisles to allow the operator to concentrate on travel and hydraulic functions of the truck and not have to worry about steering. So in the picture above, you can see here that um, this is more of an older version where you actually have rails here. And there'll be little wheels on the side of the truck that line up with this rail and basically keep it on that, on that path so that the operator doesn't have to worry about steering. On, an old, on a newer system, it is actually there's a wire built into um, underneath the concrete floor here. And there is an RF device underneath the order picker that picks up a signal from that wire. And now the, uh, the operator has to turn into the aisle, center to themselves, turn on the wire guide and switch, and then once the truck picks up the wire, the operator no longer has to worry about steering because it's on the wire guidance system. Uh, and they can focus solely on traveling and the hydraulic controls. But again, it's a neat um, tool to have. Not everybody has this. And if you are using it, uh, there's certain things that you should look out for, all right? You should always make sure that when you're entering the aisle that you are 100% sure that you have picked up the wire and you are, in fact, on the guidance system. Um, you want to stop, sound your horn, and look both ways before you exit an aisle. I think that goes uh, for all trucks, but especially on wire guidance. Um, it's especially important that you keep these aisles clean of debris. Um, because of that RF unit that's underneath the truck. If there is, you know, a piece of paper or any other kind of debris that could interrupt the signal from the RF unit to the wire and could cause the truck to lose signal. Uh, and it's, while it's rare, it does happen. Uh, the truck will lose signal, the operator doesn't become aware of it, and they will crash into one of the racks. All right, you also want to ensure that pallets are properly placed in the rack and do not stick out of the aisle. Because these aisles are so narrow, um, you have very little clearance on either side of those. So if a pallet is sticking out a few inches, you know, the operator, since they're not focusing on, on steering, you know, they may not be aware that this pallet is sticking out. And if you're traveling four or five miles per hour with this heavy lift truck, um, that could cause some serious damage to not just the product, uh, but the rack, you know, you, you can have racking collapse and that, you know, um, post a big danger to the operator as well. So another thing too is if you're sharing the aisle with somebody else with another lift truck, you want to make sure that you keep a safe distance between yourself and that other lift truck. So at this point, I am going to turn it over to Mark and Mark is going to go over the do's and don'ts for aerial work platforms. Here you go, Mark. Thank you, Rudy. Thank you, Ricky. Uh, appreciate the time today. Um, yeah, again, I'm Mark Fleischman. Uh, been an instructor for quite a while now. And I think one of the biggest things that uh, I wanted to communicate um, is the fact that when we're working with aerial lift platforms, the fact of the matter is, is um, though these are heavy units, uh, scissor lifts can you know, get uh, personnel up 50 feet. Um, usually about the cap at about 50. Uh, when we deal with boom lifts, uh, they're nearly 40,000 pounds, 20 tons uh, in some cases, and can take uh, personnel workers up 135 feet. So uh, very large pieces of equipment. But the one fundamental thing that I like to always bring to the classroom and to communicate is the fact is, is that unlike uh, power industrial trucks, though 
Um, you know, when, when accidents do happen, uh, they do sometimes, unfortunately, involve um, workers or pedestrians. When we're dealing with aerial equipment, um, the payload is always human cargo. So um, that's always something that, you know, I like to bring up in the class just to kind of reiterate again that, you know, when we're dealing with incidences, it's always going to involve you, the operator. And uh, that can get difficult sometimes. Um, the other thing is, is that, you know, I, I think, you know, with Rudy and the information about what he delivered today was, was wonderful. Great slides, great information. Um, leave an instructor like me to those kind of slides, and we, I might have to ask everyone for an intermission. So um, I kept it very clean, and the reason why I did that is because I want to talk about um, the ANSI standard specifically. Uh, A92.6 for scissor lifts and A92.5 for boom lifts. Um, you know, they have uh, quite a few similarities to them. Obviously, they talk about uh, some uniquenesses to the equipment, but um, the reality is, is that there is a laundry list of things that we have to communicate to be real effective training. And unfortunately, when we deal with ANSI standards, many employers and operators alike believe that because this is a voluntary consensus standard, somehow um, this you know, does it, doesn't involve an employer to really get engaged in that employee's training. And that is really farthest from the truth. The reality is, is they will find uh, OSHA will enforce under the general duty clause and uh, they make it very clear how um, employers have to follow these rules. Um, and because of there's a lack of OSHA standard, um, a lot of employers are just not certain on what do we have to, to do in the learning process to effectively communicate uh, good training to our employees. And there's a document that's been published by um, um, actually, it's a collaborative effort from a series of uh, organizations, uh, you know, worldwide, really. And it's called the Statement of Best Practices of General Training and Familiarization for Aerial Work Platform Equipment. Now, long title. Um, I think that we can, you know, make arrangements so we can get you. Um, if you, you know, if you were to Google that uh, from this slide. Uh, you can get that. It's a free document, and I highly recommend that everybody um, reads through that. It's, it's only a, maybe 15 pages long, and it gives you a lot of the information I'm going to provide to you right now. Um, one of the big things, uh, top on the list, is there's, there's 12 points that we have to communicate uh, to be effective training as ANSI sees it uh, regarding aerial equipment. I'll just start with the first one. So you'll see it on the slide there, um, the purpose and use of and location of manuals. So um, ANSI makes it very clear that when a piece of equipment gets delivered to you, um, either by a rental, a rental company um, or the owner of the equipment, they have to provide that manual. It needs to be available to an operator any given moment and it needs to be in a weatherproof container that's located on the lift for their reference anytime it's required. So we communicate that to our students. Uh, the proper storage and maintenance of these, of these manuals. So um, you know, they're going to be in that weatherproof box and they're always available to an operator when, when needed. Uh, we also do a, a, a pre-start inspection. We typically will do a uh, group walk around. We'll identify um, all the different components of that uh, aerial lift, be it a boom lift or scissor lift, and then we'll put it through its paces and do a function test just like a power industrial truck. Um, another key part of uh, instruction is to communicate what to look for in the workplace. Do your workplace inspection. We're going to be looking for overhead obstructions. Can we elevate um, this unit, this particular unit, is it safe to elevate it in this, uh, in this terrain or on this type of uh, angle? Uh, many times um, 
we have incidences that uh, happen because the equipment was just far too heavy for a sidewalk that someone elevated on and uh, bad things happen because of it. So uh, the operator really has a, you know, carries the onus on that one to ensure that they operate on a, uh, a supportive surface and know the weight of their equipment. And then the responsibilities associated with problems or malfunctions that affect the operation of the aerial. Um, I've done training in the past where the key was snapped off in the ignition. Well, that makes it very difficult to continue with training or to begin it in the first place. Um, as these things happen, uh, if the gate does not engage correctly or if there's uh, platform issues, this has to be communicated um, you know, to your supervisors uh, so they can get that uh, uh, a repair work accomplished effectively. Uh, and then we bring this to the classroom and, and let people know this is what we should be communicating to our to our students and operators. Um, as far as factors affecting stability, you know, many times uh, even retail uh, operations they're hanging banners or uh, they're carrying material in the air. Um, you know, we have to be very careful that we don't uh, create an instability situation. All of these things are, are um, discussed in, in our instruction. The purpose of placards and decals. Um, you know, a big one for, for us is the, the fact that, you know, the recommended max wind speed that an aerial lift should be operated in is about 28 miles an hour. And uh, that's, that's a rule of thumb. Uh, some units are designed specifically for a zero wind speed, meaning they're indoor only lifts but it is a recognized uh, policy that uh, if it is approved for outdoor use, that it's a 28 mile an hour max. So this needs to be recognized. Uh, the list uh, of fatalities is getting deeper and deeper because of this. Um, people are not familiar with uh, the fact that they need to get down and uh, put that work off if it's too windy for another day. Uh, it goes without saying safety rules and regulations. We certainly have to abide by a host site or our employer's requirements, um, along with the authorization to operate. Um, you know, if you're picked, uh, maybe maybe in your environment it's just maintenance personnel that need to get on a scissor or a boom lift, and those are the people that are authorized to operate. And then identification of hazards associated with the unit. So that is, that's a pretty extensive list. It could be overhead obstructions. It could be electrical power. Uh, wind, um, even uh, surfaces or slopes, all of these things are major factors. Uh, excess personnel in the lift, uh, lack of training is, uh, you know, can easily be determined as a, a hazardous situation. Operating and warning and instructions. This is key when, if we have a situation where we're lifting the unit uh, on a slight slope, uh, if it, it becomes out of its uh, uh, working area, uh, you'll hear uh, bells, whistles will go off in some cases, different beeping sounds. We need to be familiar with what these indicate to us as an operator. And um, certainly last but not least, demonstration of proficiency. You know, we have online training is everywhere, and uh, I am a real proponent for it. Um, I think it's great for communicating a standard operating procedure, uh, orientation for new employees, and communicating things that uh, don't involve uh, mobile equipment. Maybe at a refresher might be uh, considered. I, I like the concept of blended uh, instruction. Uh, I think there's merit in that. But when it comes to mobile equipment and people potentially um, hurting themselves or killing themselves, we certainly um, you know, we, we need to have that one-on-one uh, -on -one with an instructor and uh, communicate those things effectively. I think for, you know, I put this slide up here uh, both for boom and scissor lift. This is effective for both uh, aerial work platforms. And, um, you know, there's a section in there in both ANSI manuals uh, that um, talks about personal footing. And, Personnel shall maintain a firm footing on the platform floor while working thereon. It's very clear that 
Climbing the occupants on a mid rail or top rail is prohibited and use of anything to elevate or achieve additional height is, is prohibited. Um, putting boxes or steel containers or toolboxes up there for the sole purpose of elevating your height because your lift does not reach where you need it to go or by standing on the mid rail or top rail is absolutely prohibited. Um, there are cases where people exit the basket. They are, uh, there's additional training for that and there's a laundry list of uh, uh, safety criteria that has to be met in order for that to be done effectively and safely. Um, putting boxes in the lift or standing on a mid rail is, is absolutely uh, not acceptable. And so, um, you know, we have to be careful of that and communicate that effectively to any operator that we deal with. Now, a lot of times when it comes to training itself, um, the fact of the matter is, is people think that, you know, this is a, uh, got a joystick, it's uh, similar to a vehicle, and quite honestly, these are kind of fun to drive. And they lose sight pretty quickly on how dangerous, uh, given the right circumstances, given the lack of training, they can be. They are very safe pieces of equipment, and they're vital to uh, eliminating the use for, you know, uh, you know, extension ladders that shouldn't be there or, or getting to heights that we shouldn't uh, really consider. And so I think that, you know, the big message for me is that they do fall down and when we operate them incorrectly or do the unsafe things, um, you know, we have issues. Now I have a slide that's coming after this. It actually talks about a gentleman that uh, was, was involved in an electrocution uh, he was a construction worker, and you know it's it's it may be considered a bit graphic for the audience. And uh, you know I'm going to flip the slide. I want to make sure that if that uh, is something that's going to bother you, to please uh, you know disregard the slide. I'll keep it up for only a couple of seconds. And I think I just want to drive home the fact that this is a young man that had his whole future ahead of him, and. Uh, he, uh, he got electrocuted in an accident and, uh, you know, he became very famous in all kind of ways, but probably not the one he set out uh, to be that morning and turned out to involve many hours of, uh, of surgery and, and things of that nature. And um, basically had, um, he is the recipient of the first uh, complete face transplant. So, you know, this is a case where you know, I suppose electrocution could involve many workers. It doesn't have to involve a platform lift, but in this case it did. So, um, you know, that's, that's uh, the message that we want to drive home today. Make sure that you take the time to get the proper training. Um, employers uh, provide the, uh, the appropriate training, wherever that may be, by a qualified instructor. And uh, make sure that your troops go home safe at night. Thank you very much. Okay, Ben Stevens with ASA. Do we have some questions for our panelists today? Yes, yeah, so the first uh, question that uh, was posed, I believe, was somewhat addressed, but I'm going to go ahead and uh, read the complete question. Uh, after the incident at Notre Dame University, I spoke with an Indiana OSHA rep, and the rep stated that scissor lifts should not be in use the wind is predicted to gust to 25 miles per hour or more. I've never read any published recommendations regarding the issue. Is there any official recommended wind reading regarding this safety hazard? Uh, yes. Um, actually, you will find that um, what ends up happening is there, as far as an ANSI standard is concerned, um, you're not going to find it there. Uh, to make that standard get changed would uh, take uh, a very long time. Um, there's a lot of red tape in that. And that's typically uh, why you see the documents that uh, I talked about, the statement of best practices as it relates to aerial equipment. It is very specific in there that it talks about a 28 mile an hour wind speed. Um, additionally, um, you know, we have a requirement to go back to the aerial lift manufacturer uh, and, and reference that operator's manual. And I think 
Uh, I know for a fact that you will find that um, it will detail it in there. There's typically a sticker uh, on all newer units uh, that uh, will talk about um, 28 mile an hour wind speed or it'll have a zero wind speed, which is, like I had mentioned, uh, an indoor only lift. And if you don't see one or if there is in question, by all means, contact the uh, manufacturer of the lift and uh, ask them directly what the rated wind speed is for that aerial because uh, they will have a very definitive answer for you. Okay, next question. Is a harness and a four to six foot non-shock absorbing lanyard attached to the boom attachment of an aerial lift compliant with OSHA regulations? Um, okay, the OSHA requirement or ANSI requirement as it relates to boom lifts, it is that you are, it is mandatory that you are in a full body harness with either a, fall, a personal restraint, meaning no shock absorbing lanyard or no retractable lanyard, or you could have a fall arrest uh, shock absorbing lanyard in there. Um, and that decision is made typically uh, and direct, uh, directed by the employer to the employee. And what I have found is a lot of times the employer leaves that up to the employee. But the one steadfast true is in a boom lift, an A92.6 machine, you absolutely must be in a full body harness with one of those two lanyards. Okay. Next question is, are body belts uh, in compliance with OSHA regulations? Uh, that's a little ambiguous. Uh, what I can tell you about body belts, they were eliminated from the usage uh, for fall arrest, meaning with a shock absorber, in 1998. They can no longer be used with a shock absorbing lanyard for fall arrest, uh, simply because if you found yourself in a free fall from a boom lift, um, there was far too many instances where people were breaking them, their backs. Um, they can be used in conjunction with a full body harness. I see it rarely, but only on some occasions where, for instance, if you had a boom or a scissor lift, uh, or a boom lift, for instance, um, and it was in an area where, let's say there was a hazard within the walking platform of your lift, you may want to put an adjustable lanyard on a body belt in addition to your fall harness um, to, you know, in case you're working and you don't ever want to be able to get into that hazardous area. If it's moving, uh, like a moving auger or something like that, it would keep you away from that hazard. You know, that is a good example of how I've seen those utilized um, or to keep you away from maybe uh, some electrical power. If you needed to stay a certain distance away because of the voltage in the area, you would put that body belt on. It would restrict you into a specific area uh, so you'd never come in contact or near that hazard. But it cannot be used as a fall arrest device. Okay, we have a couple more here. Uh, next question, can you exit a boom onto a roof? Um, the technical answer is yes. Uh, it is done. Uh, the, the, the first process is to begin by contacting the manufacturer of the boom lift. Communicate to them exactly what you intend to do with the lift. Uh, you then, they will communicate to you a formal documentation. Typically, it's going to include um, a working uh, instruction, like a standard op operating procedure on how to exit the lift at height, uh, what the requirements are. Uh, I can assure you that it's going to require 100% uh, tie-off and that both the inside anchorage in the basket and outside anchorage um, is... Uh, you know, is the 5,000 pound anchorage point. 
and that you must do it through the um, the doorway. It cannot be over the top of the of the uh, handrail or anything like that. And um, once you get that back, uh, typically you would go through some kind of employee training that um, gives you the wherewithal uh, to make that process safely. And then, um, you know, that would be encompassed in your safety plan for that operation. Okay, we have uh, a couple more here. And the next question is, what is your opinion of the best use of fall protection when using scissor lifts? Well, a scissor lift, um, fall protection in a scissor lift is not governed by OSHA. It's not mandated, rather. Um, it, actually, the entity that has the power to put a worker in a harness is your employer. Um, my personal opinion is that uh, I choose not to wear one in a scissor lift primarily because uh, though I'm not an athlete, I want the opportunity to jump out of that if it were ever to be in a free fall or tipping over. Now, with that being said, that sounds, you know, pretty optimistic. The reality is, is that uh, I'm going to do everything in my power not to do things that would tip the unit over and put me in harm's way. Now, as it relates to if I ever go to train or do any work on a site where uh, that host site mandates um, fall protection, then, uh, then I have to abide by that. I have to do everything that I can to be safe in the unit, but I have to wear the harness. To get to your answer specifically, um, I know that after uh, 2006, the anchorage point on 2006 built machines and after was dropped from 5,000 pound anchorage to 3,600 pound anchorage. And what that did was technically that eliminated your ability to use a fall arrest or shock absorbing lanyard in a scissor lift. And see, that makes it uh, basically uh, not legal. So you can only use personal restraint uh, in a scissor lift. Unfortunately, um, you know, it's still left to our own honor system. I mean, if we give a guy uh, 10 feet of lanyard, uh, he still has the ability to walk the mid rail and the top rail. Uh, that's where good training and uh, understanding of, you know, by tipping this thing over, uh, it, it could come down on top of you. The other fact that you might want to consider if you're communicating to your employees, the fact is, is um, a, a good number of the scissor lifts have a horizontal or uh, the rated horizontal top top rail force is only in the neighborhood of a hundred pounds meaning when it's fully elevated it only takes about a hundred pounds to make it unstable potentially tip over if you put a man in a harness and uh, he happens to do something let's say uh, you know not in his best interest and worked on the mid rail and he tipped over or, or slipped out of the unit, uh, it would pull the machine over on top of him. And that's, that's really what we don't want to do. I hope I answered your question. I know it was long-winded, but I, I wanted to give you some detail there. Okay, I think we have time for one more. And uh, that question is, are retractables instead of a six-foot lanyard a best practice? Well, it's interesting you bring that up. I did a... Uh, I did a, um, actually, I, I attended a uh, fall protection seminar not long ago, and that question comes up because the anchorage point on a scissor is 3,600 pounds, and technically you cannot use a fall arrest device uh, like um, a retractable lanyard um, in that case. When I pose that to the fall protection experts, uh, unfortunately the answer I got was, yes, you're right, it is fall arrest. It's not a perfect science, it's the best we have. Um, personally, um, 
I don't like that only because it gives you the ability. I mean, with those kind of retractables, though they do, they you know they click fast. I mean, if something's happening, it'll stop you real quick. But it gives you that mobility to go all over that scissor lift. Um, if you're going to give a, a, a worker that kind of mobility anyway, why even bother putting them in the harness? Um, I'd rather not tie them to it and not give them at least a, an opportunity to try to get out of there four feet from the ground and jump out. A boom lift, absolutely positively different circumstance. Um, you don't typically tip over a boom lift. You're going to get ejected or thrown out of it just by the sheer design of it. Uh, scissor lifts you're going to tip over because we're either going to do something dumb on it or we're going to drive over something and uh, and it's going to tip us over. So I don't I don't like to be in a retractable and I prefer not to be tied off at all. I believe that concludes our questions. We'll hand it back have, over to you. I have you, one Ricky. last question for for Mark in in regards to uh, the operator's manual. If it dictates that there is a contact point for uh, fall protection, does that mandate that you have to wear fall protection? No. No. Okay. Okay. It's there as an option, and uh, quite frankly, I have met operators that just have that sense of comfort and want to be in a harness, even after I explain to them that it may create more of a ha hazard than without it. Um, in their opinion, that's their prerogative, and they use it, and uh, you know, that's that's the way they are. So, no, it's not mandated just because there's an anchorage point in the basket. Okay. Well, this concludes our webinar today. I want to thank Rudy and Mark, and again, thank everyone for attending today's webinar. In the near future, you will receive an email directing you to a replay of the webinar and the associated documents. Also, watch your email for announcements about future webinars, and be sure to visit the ASA website at www.asa.net. Have a safe day.